Welcome to the Even Better Podcast, where your host, Seneca Waugh of Your Clear Next Step, brings you exciting content about making communities better by helping people get even better at work. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and welcome to today's edition of the Even Better Podcast. This is Seneca Law with your Clear Next Step. We're here helping you have a better work day, and I am delighted to be back with my friend Mel World Johnson. Mel, thanks so much for coming back today. Thanks, Seneca. I'm so glad to be here. I couldn't believe when you said our last time we talked was in the end of 2020, and we're almost in February. Holy moly. Right? It's going so fast. So glad. And, and there's so much going on. There are so many different things and opportunities to help and to serve. And I just love working with you, Mel. This is so great. So for those of you who don't know Mel, let me tell you just a little bit about her. She's a coach here with Your Clear Next Step, as well as she's got other coaching work that she does. She's got this amazing career history where she's played multiple roles within everything from a business owner to working her way through the executive ranks within an organization and coaching and leading and you know, helping with talent development and leadership and business strategy. And she's got this, this heart for leaving things better than she found them and for helping people. And so those of you who know me know why I like Mel so very much. Mel, it is just a joy to have you back on this program. So we're continuing the conversation about leadership. When you were here last time, we, and if the folks, if you're listening, if you did not hear Mel's podcast last time, you need to pause this one and go back and listen to that one. No, just kidding. You don't have to pause. They're not sequential. You can catch them anytime. But be sure and go back and listen to Mel's podcast. For the last time she was here, we talked about five ways to demonstrate leadership presence. And so that was really about showing others. It was, it was demonstrating that you are a leader and the, the things that you need to do to demonstrate that. And just a wonderful session. I'm not going to do spoiler alerts. So if you haven't heard it yet, go, go do that. But today we're talking about five ways to elevate Five ways to elevate your leadership. Now let's stop for a second. Can we unpack that word elevate a little bit? What does that mean to you? Sure. When I think think of elevate, I really think of like, how do you take yourself to the next level? What are those things that can take you from where you are at currently or your present state and bring you up? Whether that is a, you think about it in percentages and it's a five to 10% lift, or you have a 10 year goal of you want to have a 50% improvement, whatever that looks like. And then really figuring out what is that plan, whether it's a development plan or goals of how many books you're going to read in a year or whatever that is, but how do you want to elevate to your next letter level of leadership? Absolutely. And so it's not, it's not just demonstrating to someone else or proving yourself as a leader. It's, it's developing, it's, it's improving yourself so that you can not, not proving, but improving yourself so that you can lift yourself and, and be elevated in the organization, either in the, into the next role or into whatever is next for you. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's dive right in. You've got five ways to elevate your leadership. So the first one that you shared is commit to continuous improvement. And as the queen of even better, you know that that you have my heart in this one, but talk to us about that one. Commit to continuous improvement. What do you mean? So for me, when I think about continuous improvement in leadership, I think mostly about my business leadership, right? Or in my, my working self. But when you think about when you're doing continuous improvement, you're naturally improving things outside of work as well. So things for me that fall in that are your commitment to reading and There are many people who say, I don't really like to read books. I read magazines. Okay. So read a business magazine, read a magazine that really speaks to you on the things you want to do. Maybe it's articles on planes. Once we're back to regular plane travel and doing things like that. Great. But that reading and the amount of hearing those voices of other strong individuals, whether you're a Simon Sinek fan or a Sheryl Sandberg fan, or you're reading books about whatever it may be, the increase one, it improves your vocabulary, right? You're going to see new words, but it's also going to teach you new ways or different approaches and a different lens to look at something that maybe you've always done the same way. So I think that's super important. The other thing I think about is in your profession or in what you do, how are you working to work towards whether it's additional credits of continuing education, certifications that you're trying to build towards, even if it's something that has nothing to do with your work, but maybe it's women in leadership, maybe it's a certification on finance for non-financial managers. So what are you doing to help give yourself a broader or a larger umbrella or base that you can pull from, from that knowledge? The other two things that I think about when I think about continuous learning is coaching and mentorship. Do you have a mentor, right? And the thing that came up the other day for me is I was talking with a client and they said, well, I need to pick a mentor. And I said, why do you only have to have one? And they had this moment like, oh my gosh, I can have more than one mentor. And I was like, well, 
how much time are you committing to this? And if it's an hour long mentor call or meeting once a month, could you have a second? Like, do you have two hours to spare a month? And they were like, wow, that was my big aha today. I said, <laughs> I don't just have to have one. Like I could have someone that fills this area that I'm trying to improve and someone that fills a different area. And so how, how does that look for you? And if you don't have a mentor, how can you seek one? If you have one, does a second mentor serve you, right? Is it something that adds value to what you're trying to do? So those are the big ones for me on uh, continuous improvement. Wonderful. So as you, as you talked about that and you described the, the reading, I, I am a, an avid reader. I'm also a lover of books, right? I don't, I don't really love the online reading or the any, any of the, the apps like that. I like the, the smell and the touch and the feel of paper and books. And so this is one of those cases where the giant stack of books to be read is totally like, it's legit. I'm allowed to have it. Not because it keeps getting taller, but because I take one off the top, but then I add some more to the bottom every time I turn around. So that, that stack is, is continuous, but it's okay in this context. It's okay to have a stack of books to be read because that's helping commit to that continuous improvement. Absolutely. And I, I'm giggling over here and you, the, the folks at home can't hear that, but it's, I have a stack of books on my uh, printer. I have a stack of books over on my bookshelf and in my bedroom, I have a stack of books next to like on my nightstand. And so, at, you know, my husband, the other day, he's like, are you still reading that book? I'm like, yeah, I'm in chapter two, but I've got that other book that I'm working on. And so, yes, it's constantly in flux for sure. <laughs> For sure. Oh, that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's get to number two. So five ways to elevate your leadership. The first one is commit to continuous improvement. The second one is listening to truly hear. And this is following on a theme. We've heard you talk about listening before, but let's talk about listening to truly hear. I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Seneca. So for me, I haven't always been a good listener, right? And that was one of the things that on my journey, I would interrupt people. I would interrupt people again. I was told to stop interrupting people and I just, it wasn't sticking. And that journey for me, that was probably one of my hardest leadership lessons was just learning how powerful it is to truly listen to someone and listen to them to hear them. And why I say that is because this one's so personal for me. And when you turn your phone over, you shut off your monitor, you close your laptop, you stop thinking about the next meeting that you had or the to-do list that's sitting on your desk and you truly are in the moment with the person you're meeting with, you're making eye contact. You're not, you're, you're truly listening to hear them. And when I say that, like not to think of what question you're going to ask them, but you're just in the moment. And when they are done speaking, you pause for one or two seconds and take it all in and think about what you actually want to ask. And it's not a, a pre- thought of question, you're just in the moment. And for me, the impact that that has had to just truly listen and oh, Seneca, the, the way you deepen relationships with your staff and your family and your loved ones and your friends. And when they see you actually truly listen, like I get a little bit, like I get a little misty eyed because I wish I would have learned this journey at 27, not at 37, right? Or whatever year it was when it finally, like enough times I got struck, right? Of stop interrupting, start really listening. And so listening to truly hear for me is a really big one. And most of us don't even realize that we're not really listening. We're, we're listening, but we're listening with an intent to ask our next question instead of just listening to hear what they have to say. To hear. Yep. I love it. Okay, five ways to elevate your leadership. The first one was commit to continuous improvement and then listening to truly hear. So let's go back to number three, which is also familiar. I, I think you've talked about something along these lines before, but it bears repeating because a lot of us are not good at it. Asking open-ended question is your third way to elevate your leadership. Asking open-ended questions. Give us some examples of that now. Sure. For me, this one is really about the amount of information and learning what your team and the people you're communicating with really have to say. And this goes back to listening, right? So if you ask a question of, would you like to do that, right? You get a yes or a no. Well, where do you go from that? What if you're talking to someone that they really don't want to engage with you and you give them a yes or no question? Well, they answered you. So now you have to either try to pull something out of them or how could you better phrase that instead of, would you like to do that? How would you like to approach that? Mm. Just by changing that from a yes or no to a how. And I talk about this a lot. If you can change any question you're going to ask, that isn't a closed ended of, would you like to do that? Did you like your lunch yesterday? 
was school good today? Right. So you think about parents with kids trying to get them to tell them how their day was and you replace those closed ended questions or a yes or no, or a one answer question with a what question or a how, what did you do at school today? Right. Mm -hmm. You get that ability where, and then wait. The other thing I would say about the open-ended questions is, is once you ask the question, pause, like give, give someone three to five seconds to think about how they want to respond. How would you like to tackle the things we have on our plate for the weekend? Or are you ready for the weekend? Are you ready for the weekend is a yes or no. How would you like to tackle the things on our list for the weekend is open-ended. Well, what I'd like to do is let's do something fun first, and then we'll tackle the house projects that no one really wants to do or the grocery shopping. Right. And so I know I'm aligning these with home projects, but this goes with work too. And you think about talking with your team about, did you like the meeting yesterday? No. Did you like the meeting yesterday? Yeah. What was your biggest takeaways from the meeting yesterday? Mm -hmm. It frames up that question totally different and giving your team, whether you're managing up or managing down. And I know we talked about that before. When you ask open-ended questions, it's pretty amazing what you find out and giving them the space to tell you what they think, right? Mm -hmm. No, oh, I love, love the reminder that something as simple as what, what happened today? What did you think of? What did you find as, in, instead of the, the closed ended, like the, the, did you, or, or didn't you, but that just that simple word, what, and the, and the word, how those are not hard words to remember. It's not new vocabulary. We just some no. of us have to remember to, to put them into our conversation. I was having a, a discussion just recently with another colleague who was making a similar approach, Joe Van Hackey, actually, he, he talks about implied improvisation and how it applies to, to leadership and to communication. And he was building on that yes and kind of idea. And the, you know, when you gotta, you gotta give something, someone something else to build on, right? And when you're asking a, a what question or a how question, you're, you're giving the other person something to build on in the conversation. And one of the things, one of the ahas I had out of that was this realization that if, if you're a control freak, that's really hard. If you mm -hmm. have wrestled with control freak tendencies and you like to control the conversation, I like to know how long it's going to last. I like to know that they're going to only see things that I'm predicting. Then I'm going to ask a question that either I already know the answer to, or that I, that I can manage and contain. And so you start asking open-ended questions and, and who knows what they're going to say. And, and so I, I challenge anyone who's listening right now, if, if, you, if you have ever, you know, recognized by looking in the mirror that there might be a control freak looking back at you, this is a place to, to really, really invest in that, that continuous improvement and really, really seek to ask open-ended questions. And if you don't mm -hmm. know someone, like if you don't naturally do that, find someone who does and, and listen to them and, you know, observe them and pay attention to them. Because those open-ended questions, Mel, you're, you are so right. That is that's how you get people to open up and oh, so beautiful. Oh, thanks, Seneca. When I heard you talk about the person, the control freak that is knows where they want to go and whatnot, it makes me think of leading questions. They'll ask an open-ended question, but it has like a particular direction towards it where you, you can feel that they're leading you towards the path they want. And so listen for that too. The other thing I do consciously is when I'm thinking of a question, I'll think quickly is this closed-ended or open-ended? And if it's closed, I'll take a moment to reframe it in a what or a how, and just take that moment. Eventually you'll get where you really easily catch yourself of, I don't really want a yes or no. I want to know more, right? That tell me more, whatever that type of phrase, give yourself that permission to pause for a second and say, is this a question I really want to ask? Because sometimes the first question is the easiest one, but it's not the one that's going to really tell you or give them the opportunity to share. That. You bet. And I love that you had household examples as well as a parent. I, I have used with my kids for the longest time. Tell me something nice from your day today, right? Now, now we're framing both the question as well as because I'm a control freak. I'm also asking them to, to tell me something positive, right? Tell, let's, let's start this conversation in a positive frame of mind, and then we can address other challenges if we need to. But so tell me more about, or, yeah. or give me more words on those. Those are, those are other phrases I've used. All right. Time's mm -hmm. running away from us. We better keep going. We are here with okay. Mel Worrell. If you don't know Mel, you should. So check her out on our website at yourclearnextstep.com. You can find Mel uh, and her products and services available. If you go to our team, you can learn more about Mel. And if you start looking into leadership coaching and executive coaching, for sure, you can find more about Mel. And in this conversation, we're talking about five ways to elevate your leadership. So we talked about committing to continuous improvement, listening to truly hear, asking open-ended questions. And now we're on number four and I, th this one, this one's going to, I just, I can't wait to hear where you're going to go with this is you said that a fourth way to elevate your leadership is to stop asking why. 
what, Mm -hmm. where are you going with that? Sure. So this one I love, and I, on purpose for number three, about asking open-ended questions, we did not talk about why I did not give that as an example. I talked about how and what, and how we ask close-ended questions for me, why So let's step back to when we're two or three years old. One of the first questions we start asking our parents all the time is why, why? And I'm doing a kid voice, right? A terrible impression of a child voice, but we have been ingrained since we are very small humans that we ask why, and we're seeking information. However, as we get older and you think about some of the context that we get to why, why did you do that? It can put your guard up a little bit. Maybe it raises your hackles. Maybe it makes you feel a little defensive, like you're getting put into a box and now you need to push out on defending why you made the decision you did. Why isn't a terrible word, but your tone and your approach and your body language, if you're going to use why is super important. And if you're going to ask why, how could you reframe it in a question that isn't why? So I... If I ask why, I probably am having um, what I would call a a leadership brain fart. I try to not use why because I don't want anyone to be on the defensive. And the other thing about why is a lot of times we ask why questions and it's asking about the past, right? Why did you do that? Why are you thinking that? And in a lot of times, the past doesn't necessarily matter. It's how we're moving forward. And so how do we find some constructive language that isn't making someone necessarily defend their position? And how do we move forward? So for me, why can just cause some angst? And at times it's not even meant to be that way. And Seneca, you and I are both disc facilitators. And so I think about people that have a D style, right? So they're they're more of a dominant style. When they ask why, it's going to come across very different than a person who is an S style and how they ask why. And so just some of it is more about being self-aware. And if you're going to ask why, make sure your tone and your body language are representing what you're trying to to come across. Yep, love it. So uh, for a lot of our listeners are business analysts because I have a career in business analysis and that's kind of where I grew up in in the industry in project management and business analysis. So lots of readers and, and followers in that space. And one of the first business analysis techniques that we're taught is the, the model of the five whys. So you're supposed to ask why five times, why is this problem? Why does this problem exist? You know, what, why, why is this? What's going on? What, why, 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 and why does this problem exist? And why does this problem exist? Uh, why do you want that? So we ask why about five times to kind of get to the root cause. Now, one mm-hmm. of the things I did maybe, oh, it's, it's been a few years ago now. I, I don't dare count how many years it's been, but I introduced another way, an alternative, being sensitive to that sometimes when people hear why they, they hear it in it and they, they get kind of defensive and it's accusatory. And so I offered mm-hmm. five other ways to ask why without asking why, like, how did this come mm-hmm. to be? What is the backstory mm-hmm. that I need to understand that can help inform the future? What is the business driver here? So there are other, other ways, how, how, and, and where did this come from? And what are the other sources? If you're, if you really are looking at root cause, then, then asking those questions, but even then, Maybe just asking why is is not something that's going to help us elevate our leadership. They really, really, really need to do to, to be more intentional about how it comes across to others so that we can elevate our leadership. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And I love, and even in sales, they talk about you have to ask multiple times. And usually it's, you know, why, why is this something you're looking to make a difference in? And so there's lots of things along the way that we've learned to ask why, however, What is the position that it puts us in with how the other person's perception is of what we're asking? You bet. You bet. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things on this, uh, at the risk of of belaboring this, I think one of the things I want to be really cognizant of on this one is this is not, it's it's not like a change in philosophy. It's Mm -hmm. not, it's not like one of those, oh, with child rearing, there was like, first you have to put your baby to sleep on their tummy and then it was back to sleep and and we didn't know what was safer, right? This is not a reversal. This is a change in language and an awareness of your audience and adjusting your approach so that your audience can, can be heard and can connect with you. Is that a fair way to put that? Absolutely. And even your reframing of taking a why question and making it a how, just the tone of how that comes out when you were saying that, and I'm hearing you say to me, instead of why did you do that? How did we come to this conclusion? it has a totally different like feeling as it's coming towards me. And as we all know, 
our intent sometimes does not match the the perception of the person who's receiving our message. And so it's less about us and more about how the who the person or how the person we're speaking with is taking our, our question, right? And so for me, I do fall in the, the DI, right? A dominant influencer. And so I do have to be very careful about the question why. And there are others that they can use why and it comes off great. And so knowing what is most authentic to you too. So when I say stop using why, it doesn't mean like hard line in the sand, don't ever ask why again. But when you use it, make sure you understand the tone and the context and how the other person is is hearing the language you're using with them. Lovely, lovely. Okay, so let's move on to the fifth one. Uh, five ways to elevate your leadership. The fifth topic you have here is be transparent. That ties really well with what I, I think where you were just starting to go with that last conversation about being transparent. What is what does that mean as a leader, Mel? Yeah. So I think at times, and this is obviously my opinion in leadership and along the way, I've worked for great leaders and I've worked for leaders that I learned many things I would never do in my leadership style, which is also a blessing, right? And the leaders who I always admired and wanted to mirror or chameleon their style, they were transparent. And what I mean by transparent is they shared with us how we were doing things and what that impact was and what our desired outcomes were and the reasoning why they made decisions. They didn't tell us or be transparent so we could challenge them or say, we don't think we should do it that way, but it was never go do this and not tell us the, the, the reasoning behind it. And the other thing about transparency is being transparent doesn't mean that you're oversharing or that you're sharing critical information that only the person at the people at your level are supposed to know, but it's being transparent in a way that when you're managing up, you're being transparent with your, your senior leadership or the C-suite, whoever you're reporting to, but also being transparent to your team that reports to you. Because at times, sometimes you can feel as a, a part of a team that you're a little bit in the dark, like you have your tactical things you're working on in your role. And if you had a little bit bigger picture and that transparency of what's going on in the whole organization, it gives you more direction about the meaning that what you're doing on your day-to-day -day actually has as an impact to the whole org. And transparency also develops trust and it helps in that relationship, whether you're managing up or managing down in just the communication that you have with your team and that they feel like you're telling them what they need to know and not necessarily more than they need to know, but what they need to know so that they're, everyone's working towards that common goal. Absolutely. It's we, as humans, we don't like to be treated like mushrooms, right? We don't like to be kept in the dark. We, mm -hmm. we need that, that clarity of message. And, you know, it's a really good point. It's not about oversharing and it's not about sharing something that, that you're not supposed to share. I, I think I'll, I've watched leaders who have arrived, kind of, they, they've moved to the next level and then they, they sort of get faced with things that they're not sure what to do with. It's, it's a new mm -hmm. level of, of information perhaps, or a new level of, and, and they're not sure how transparent to be. So I, I think your words of caution here would be well served for those that it's, it's not, you don't say everything that, that doesn't make sense. That's not appropriate, but that you are authentic and genuine in your message and that you are sharing the things that are true and you're sharing what you can when you can share it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that you, you restated that perfectly. I've, I've got a, a very dear friend who is currently working in an organization that they're, they're struggling and that they're, they're losing staff and employees and leaders and, and people who've been there for years are going because there was a, a recent shift in leadership and the, and the new approach is one of non-communication. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, the, the new one is there is a broadcast type message once a month. And otherwise there is, there's no two way in and out of the office. There's, there's no regular messaging. There's, there's no, there's not great response to emails or, or questions. And I just think about that, that transparency, even if the message is tough, right? These are tough times for a lot of organizations. And even if the message is tough or your message to your team is this is, we're in a tough spot right now, that transparency allows the team to not fear and not, not imagine the worst or play those hideous games of Mad Libs, right? Which mm -hmm. is what we do when we want to fill in the blanks, but allows yeah. them to, to, to have that confidence that no, you, you know what's going on and, and we're, doing, we're doing the right things to move us forward. Yeah, a hundred percent. When you're transparent to your point of the ad libs, if people don't have answers, they'll fill in the blanks. And generally those assumptions of what is filled in the blanks are not accurate, but people tend to think the worst. So if you're not communicating, 
people left in the dark will spin off into multiple directions. And generally the mind does not go to the place of everything is good and going fine. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, but it's the truth. And so, yeah, the more that you help fill in those gaps, you just, you help your team. They want to work together better. They're going to be more cohesive. They're going to share with you more too. So speed of the leader, speed of the pack. I, it's a phrase I say all the time. If you're transparent, your team is probably going to also be transparent back with you. So it just creates a really good culture. It does. And, and following that sort of positive art, can, can you think of any examples where you watched someone be transparent, either one of your leaders or a leader that you've coached along the way and, and seen like material results or material changes out of the, the, the relationship with the team when they, when they really were able to, to be more transparent? Sure. Yeah. I actually, I think of a current client right now and it was about people going around how she had done things and setting, restating very transparently, like, this is how we're going to do things. And the reaction initially was a little bit like, wow. And over a week's time to have a couple people that I wouldn't call them dissenters, but people that really push the issue on purpose to have them come back and say, I did some reflection and realized that I've probably been one of the reasons that caused this to have to be brought up again. And just that transparency of process and why they're doing what they're doing. And I'm saying why they're right. So don't hear me about not saying why, but really stating the purpose of why the process was in place to have some efficiencies and effective and initially being a bit fearful of what that transparency would bring and that the opposite happened, that it really helped align everyone in the organization to be smarter and work more efficiently together. Right. And it really was about working together. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. So yeah. we have just listened to Mel Worrell share five ways to elevate your leadership, commit to continuous improvement, listen to truly hear, ask open-ended questions, stop asking why, and be transparent. Five things that we can all continue to practice at. Mel, I know that continuous improvement is near and dear to your heart, and this is the Even Better podcast, of course. So I'm going to ask you, what's making you even better right now? Sure. I always love this question. And when I was preparing for today, I was like, oh, I, I forget that Seneca always asked this and I love it. But for me, it's networking. It's networking with like-minded coaches. It's networking with other business owners and entrepreneurs on how they're doing business, how they're creating real relationships with their clients. And it's not about a transactional sale, but it's about how are we all being better for one another? So I love that. Mm -hmm. We talked about reading. I read a lot. And then the other thing I'm starting is as a coach, there's different accreditations or certifications that you can earn. And through the ICF, I just applied for my ACC, which I'm super excited about my accredited coaching certification, and I'm working towards the classwork. So you have to have training hours. So I'm starting my PEP, which will give me the hours I need and then work on the rest of it to apply for my PCC, which is my professional coaching certification. So I'm really excited about that journey and continuing to improve how I help my clients, right? Outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of how you help your clients, you've got a new program coming up and I am so thrilled to be partnering with you on this. Can we take just a couple minutes and, and talk about this program, maybe your vision behind it or the, the target audience for this? And, and like in, in your words, Mel, what, what is this really cool program? Sure. So Seneca, I just ditto your comments. Like I am so thrilled to partner with your clear next step and this program. So it's a 10 month program and it's called elevating your leadership, your executive mindset. And where this really started from was how do we, and when I think about my leadership journey and just what could have helped me be a stronger leader and more confident leader earlier in my career. And so this program is really targeted towards leaders that are already in a leadership role. You're currently identified on, on a succession plan. You're working towards the C-suite or a senior vice president level. And some of that foundational part of leadership and having a broad umbrella of knowing things outside of your org. So many times we work in a vertical. And so how do you build that well-rounded knowledge so that you really understand how things impact one another. So things around personal effectiveness, having a coach approach with your team, working towards having some, we have some assessments within the program that really talk about how do you work best as a leader? How do you work best as an individual? There's new data in there that talks about how do you work best working from home? So as the world has shifted from working from home, so there's some cool things there. And even I'm looking through the, the outline that we've worked together to do, but even things around 
human resources and management fundamentals. And maybe you're in the sales part of the business, or maybe you're not in any type of that avenue, but understanding some of those core things that help you be a better leader as you're moving forward and really giving you that strong foundation. So anything that comes your way, you have tools and resources to look back on, but also just the networking within the group that will create with these leaders of people that you build this relationship with over 10 months that become some of your trusted peers on sharing information, sharing ideas, talking about situations, really looking forward to having this group program that is about elevating your leadership, taking you to the next level. So great. And it's really honing in that executive presence in that your, your executive mindset and, and making sure it is rounded in that way. So let's talk about the structure. So you, you said it's a 10 month program. It's got 15, right? 15 group sessions and it's group sessions. So is this a large group or a small group? Yep. What's our, what's kind of our, what's your thinking here about a group? Oh, yeah. So ideally the maximum would be 10. And the reason why that is, is too big of a group is frankly, just too big of a group. We want this to be a small group that we feel there is trust in the group. There is the ability for everyone to share and have openness and conversation. Each of the sessions or group meetings are going to be 90 minutes so that we have enough time to dig into the meat of it, but that we also have time to have good discussion and talk about where you're at, what's going on and relevant topics that are going on in your world right now in the role that you're in and how it aligns. And then within every other month, there's a partner pairing. So for example, the first month is uh, one session. The second month, the first session will be around communications and the partner pairing is going to be around the DISC profile or the DISC assessment. So everyone will take that profile. Everyone will have that profile prior to coming into the group session. We'll talk about it as a group. And then one of the things you and I had worked on is that there is an option for people to invest in individual coaching in addition. So then we can dig into their one-on-one specific issues in more of a, uh, not more of a, in a formal coaching relationship where we're talking about the things that you're working on specifically to elevate your leadership and what's happening with, with you right now. Where are you right now? Outstanding. Outstanding. And the one other piece that I I don't know that we've gotten to in this quick conversation is the, the, the reading list you have incorporated some just fabulous resources into this. Talk, talk to us a little bit about the, your vision for that and the, the, how does that work with that reading list? Yeah. So every person within the group will have the list of reading. So whether you're a great reader or you kind of like reading or you don't read at all, right? You can be in any one of those realms, depending on how you like to take in books. It could be like you said, you like to physically feel the book. There will be book abstracts as well. So if you're not an avid reader and you'd rather read the abstract, we're going to have those available. Maybe you're an audible type of person where you want to listen to them auditory. You'll have the books in advance, especially if we start getting some more car time, right? It's a great opportunity to use audible to listen to the books while you're driving, but they're intentional, right? So thinking about first session is kickoff and motivation and Simon Sinek's start with why. So kind of they all have a theme and go with the session that we're talking about. So prior to coming into the session that you're looking at the material, reading the book, reading the abstract, listening to the book so that we're prepared to have a really meaty discussion on how do we take those core things we took out of that material and then how do we implement, right? So all of this information, doing a group coaching program is fantastic, but what are you going to do to take action, right? So all of this is great, but without action, it's just a bunch of words and time that you've spent with amazing people, right? That you're, you're learning from, but how do we make that actionable or how do you make that actionable to see the impact in your leadership? Absolutely. Thank you, Mel. This, I am so looking forward to this program and these, these seats are going to sell out. I have no doubt. So I, I hope that if you're listening and this is something that you're interested in, that you go to our website and go check it out, get yourself enrolled. And this is going to be just a, an outstanding program with really focused attention from this outstanding leader that you just heard from just now, Mel Worrell. Thanks, Mel, Seneca. You bet. Mel, thank you so much for being here today. And to those of us who are joining us on the Even Better podcast, thanks for being here and uh, we will catch you all next time. Thank you for tuning in today. The Even Better podcast will be back with more content soon. But in the meantime, subscribe to our podcast or check out our website at yourclearnextstep.com for more information. See you next episode.